He flicked the igniter and the house jumped up in a gorgeous fire that burned the evening sky red, yellow, and black. This quote creates a good opening statement about the book. It shows that the firemen in the book are not quite the same as they are in present times. The hound half rose in its kennel and looked at him with green-blue neon light flickering in its suddenly activated eyes. It growled again, a strange rasping combination of electric sizzle, a frying sound, a scraping of metal, a turning of cogs that seemed rusty and ancient with suspicion. This quote shows that this book takes place in the future as this robotic technology is not available in current times. It also shows that the firemen in the book have a different purpose as no firehouse today would need such a machine. He caught her shrieking. He held her and she tried to fight away from him. No, Millie, no. Wait, stop it, will you? You don't know. Stop it. He slapped her face. He grabbed her again and shook her. This dialogue in the book shows the difference between Mildred and Montag's morals. On one hand, Montag wishes to see what is so important about books and wishes to explore them, while Mildred is worried of government retaliation. Mildred tries to burn the books, but Montag won't allow it. This creates a conflict between them. This could be foreshadowing of how loyal Mildred is to Montag. Denim's dentrifice. Shut up, thought Montag. Consider the lilies of the field. Denim's dentrifice. They toil not. Denim's. Consider the lilies of the field. Shut up, shut up. Dentrifice. He tore the book open and flicked the pages and felt them as if he were blind. He picked at the shape of the individual letters not blinking. Denim's. Spelled D-E-N. They toil not. Neither do they. A fierce whisper of hot sand through empty sieve. Denim's does it. Consider the lilies, the lilies, the lilies. Denim's dental detergent. Shut up, shut up, shut up. It was a plea, a cry so terrible that Montag found himself on his feet. The shocked inhabitants of the loud car staring back, moving from this man with the insane, gorged face, the gibbering, dry mouth, flapping book in his fist. This shows how Montag, in herself, is trying to reject the outside world in its distractions. Go home. Montag fixed his eyes upon her quietly. Go home and think of your first husband divorced and your second husband killed in a jet and your third husband blowing his brains out. Go home and think of the dozen abortions you've had. Go home and think of that your damn cesarean sections too, and your children who hate your guts. Go home and think how it all happened, and what did you ever do to stop it. Go home. Go home, he yelled, before I knock you down and kick you out of the door. This shows how Montag is fed up with Mildred's friends and their lifestyles. He snapped it on. Montag, the TV set said and lit up. M-O-N-T-A-G. The name was spelled out by the voice. The intensity of Montag's delinquency is to the point that he is being broadcast on the television and is being hunted. And then he was a shrieking blaze. A jumping, sprawling, gibbering mannequin. No longer human or known. All writhing flame on the lawn as Montag shot one continuous pulse of liquid fire on him. There was like a hiss like a great mouthful of spittle, banging a red-hot stove, a bubbling and frothing as if salt had been poured over a monstrous black snail to cause a terrible liquefaction and a boiling over of a yellow foam. Montag shut his eyes, shouted, he shouted, and fought to get his hands at his ears to clamp all to cut away. And the sound, Beatty flopped over and over and over, and at last twisted in on himself like a charred wax doll and lay silent. Beatty had tried to reel Montag back to being a law-abiding citizen throughout the book, but was unable to do so. Beatty had given up on Montag and decided to lead the hunt in detaining Montag. Instead, Montag had cornered Beatty in a weakened mindset. Montag had finally gotten rid of Beatty. His eyes burnt white now, as his head jerked about to confront the flashing glare. Now the beetle was swallowed in its own light. Now it was nothing but a torch, hurtling upon him. All sound, all blare, now almost on top of him. That wasn't the police, he thought. He looked down the boulevard. It was clear now. A car full of children, all ages. God knew from twelve to sixteen, out whistling, yelling, hurrahing, had seen a man, a very extraordinary sight, a man strolling, a rarity, and simply said, let's get him. Not knowing he was a fugitive, Mr. Montag. In the book, we see that society isn't like what we see today. This further proves that statement. For young teens to be driving about in the streets while a manhunt is going down is almost unheard of. 
let alone they intended to run someone over. The cameras rushed down. The hound leapt up into the air with a rhythm and a sense of timing that was incredibly beautiful. Its needle shot out. It was suspended for a moment in their gaze, as if to give the vast audience time to appreciate everything. The raw look of the victim's face, the empty street, and the steel animal, a bullet nosing the target. Montag, don't move, said a voice from the sky. The camera fell upon the victim, even as did the hound. Both reached him simultaneously. The victim was seized by the hound and camera in a great spider and clenching grip. He screamed. He screamed. He screamed. The government captured and killed an innocent man because they thought that it was taking too long. They treated the live TV broadcasting of the manhunt like reality TV. It was taking too long and people were losing interest, so they decided to end it by killing an innocent man.